Hi, everyone. Welcome to Master the World. We're just getting started here, so we'll give it a moment as people trickle in. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to we're, Master the World. We're all hoping wherever you are that there are not too many fires around you. Fires, Crazy times. hurricanes, what have you. Yeah. Welcome to Master the World. We're just waiting for everyone to trickle in. Uh, feel free to use the chat box to tell us where you're dialing in from today. Ah, <laughs> there, we <go. laughs> there we go. You're getting ahead of yourself there, Lee Mang. I am, I am I'm trying to move this chat box over here. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, I think we're gonna be- Oh, uh, Seattle, hey, Catherine. Oh, here we go. Pretty smoky. I'm glad you're not evacuated yet. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I'm Lee Ming Stro, the CEO and co-founder of Master the World. I have with me three awesome panelists. Uh, first, Evan Goldstein. And uh, Master Sommelier. Oh, I don't know why there is an echo. No, that's, that's a friend of mine, so it's, it's going away, went away. Okay, great. And then uh, we also have with us Madeline Trafon from Michigan, Master Sommelier. And last but not least, uh, Tim Gazer coming in from uh, New Mexico. And thanks to everyone who is writing in. We love hearing from you. Hi, Mary. Um, and I love to see that we have people coming in from Vegas as well. Thank you and welcome to Master the World. Uh, today's webinar is on KITS 108A. If you, are, um, if you are tasting with us today without a kit, that is absolutely fine. If you're tasting with us, just know that we're going to go pretty fast. Um, but if you're not uh, tasting with us, we will give you all of the clues for you to guess along and play with our polls. So you'll have fun too. Without further ado, I'm going to just remind everyone that this is our fourth webinar and our sixth kit. Uh, it's been six kits in. Uh, Evan and I can tell you that uh, our operations, at some point we'll do a post, I think, Evan, of uh, how crazy our, our cases of wine and warehouse has been, but we've grown tremendously. So thank you again for all your support. Um, if you joined us from Indiegogo and you ordered six kits, know that this is your last kit and we hope that you'll be back for more. Um, and this last kit, we made a decision to send it out next day air um, to most of you who are far away, um, even if you didn't pitch in uh, to get it next day air, because we just felt like it was way, way, way too hot. Um, our surrounding area in Sonoma County was up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, even more on some days. So we're going to keep monitoring the weather. Starting with the next um, kit, you'll have an option to hold for another month. I think that it should hopefully cool down in October. Uh, that said, uh, we hope that you'll stand, stay engaged um, and join our leaderboard. If you're tasting along, you can just enter in the leaderboard. Our leaderboard code is CW72. And I want to do a shout out to three people from the 106A um, kit. Uh, Justin Chin, Sheng Li Hu, and Christian from Ohio. Thank you very much. Welcome, Evans Cat. Uh, <laughs> for playing along. Um, these are the top three uh, who hit the top three spots on our leaderboard. Um, so if you guys would join the leaderboard today, we'll definitely announce who's the top three the next webinar as well. Um, there's, you know, we're all learning along and so it's fun to see um, who's really challenging yourselves to being on the leaderboard. Uh, questions, please ask away. We have a chat for uh, casual conversations, but we also have a Q&A. So feel free to throw your questions in the Q&A. Um, chances are, if you've got the question, others have it too. So you'll help be helping everyone else out by asking the question. It can be anonymous, or you can make it um, so that uh, it's obvious who's asking and you can thumbs up or thumbs down on the question. Actually, no thumbs down on questions, only thumbs up. Um, and then last but not least, we will do a poll today and survey at the end. So if you have anything that you want to add to help us out here uh, to improve your experience, let us know. 
Without further ado, I'm looking at time. I would love to kick things off. We're mixing things up today, and we're going to start with uh, Master Sommelier Madeline Trafon out in Michigan. Madeline. Go, Maddie. Hi, everybody. I want you to be nicely jealous because we came off a really humid bank, and now we have absolutely perfect weather. This is uh, that little blip when Michigan in the, in the um, you know, towards the fall uh, and in the spring has absolutely ideal weather. So I have my windows wide open and a fan going. Um, thrilled to be with you. Thank you for letting me lead off. I have, uh, I'm not competitive, uh, so I don't get on uh, leaderboards, but I hang out with two gentlemen who, you know, raise my bar. So I'm thrilled to be tasting with them. And uh, I'm going to start with wine number one. Um, just to remind everyone, um, we, you know, go through this relatively quickly and I'm going to mention the things that um, lead the wine to me, that strike me the most. Um, aromatically, uh, flavor, texture, uh, and then the whole picture. Uh, so we're going to be going through, uh, Li Meng is going to be uh, paging through, right? Yep. yep. And this is uh, a wine that we tasted together some time ago. And I tasted it about an hour ago and retasted it a few minutes ago. And I may keep um, doing just that. So, um, you know, to remind us all, looking at it is, uh, is important because it sets you up for everything that's to come. And when you're talking about deduction, especially, it can be really key, especially if you're tied in a knot. So looking at this, you know, it is quite bright. Um, it has this beautiful, uh, and it's quite clear and light. It's got this straw green look to it, or a uh, very pale yellow with a little green glint. Um, no bubbles, but it's, uh, it's very shiny. So note to self, it looks young, it looks healthy, it looks attractive. And um, green is uh, a little bit of uh, a cue, especially for youth. And then um, I've been telling people sort of during these sessions and also post session, especially if you get confused with all the options that you're staring at, it doesn't hurt to, you know, taste the wine, have a clear um, impression of it, and then start going through uh, the profile so that, you know, your perception is clear and you're not swayed by all the options that are coming in front of you. Just a, a note to self. Um, so I'm going to be talking about both aroma and flavor on this. The nose to me, was and is uh, verging on explosive, actually very lush and ripe, and it's a combination uh, immediately of citrus and stone fruit right up front, almost mouth-watering. You know, I'm looking forward to acidity when I smell it. So it is, at least uh, in all of my experience with this wine, then and now, highly aromatic and forward. Um, in terms of specific citrus, lemon and lime for sure, and ripe. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, tree and vine fruit, the thing that I get both on the nose and on the palate is this beautiful green apple and green pear character. So, you know, um, fresh and ripe fruit, um, but tart in a way that is uh, correct to the fruit that it's expressing. The stone fruit has an illusion of sweetness to it, especially, you know, when you can you know, channel ripe apricots, ripe nectarines, uh, ripe peaches. This is the time of year where we get Georgia peaches in, uh, in uh, Michigan and uh, we pay plenty of money for them and we're grateful that we did it. Um, the other thing too, that is the second wave aromatically, and I'm not even really talking about the palate yet, is uh, florality. It's very strong. If you go down to the, um, the third line there, you know, all these fruit blossoms, apple blossom, lime, lemon blossom, but also honeysuckle um, and jasmine. Sometimes it's a little confusing when you get a lot of um, uh, flower options. So you can keep it simple if you like. So that's why I throw in here a little bit of a fruit blossom impression and it's almost perfumed. Go back to tropical for a moment. There's definitely a tropical element aromatically, but what struck me and it follows through on the palate is passion fruit. You have the sort of sweet tart character to it. Um, and then sort of go down to even past herbal, a little bit of lemongrass, but it's not a big player here. However, other, honey, 
there's uh, again um, an impression of um, of sweetness that's honeyed and almost candied and beeswaxy on the nose. And then uh, I've gone ahead and tasted it. I'm not going to gurgle at you uh, through my earbuds, but uh, uh, the the acidity on this was almost a shock, but welcoming. Um, it was I was expecting it from the you know the tart aromatics especially from the green apple and the, the lemon lime citrus but it is very cleansing very mouth-watering and right on the heels of get that that you get a very strong element of uh, inorganic uh, earth whether you want to call it chalk limestone flint slate mineral rock i'm of the camp that i like defining inorganic earth and i might get precious beyond that but i often don't um zippo oak uh, on any you know uh, uh, channel that I can possibly perceive. Ditto, oxidation, chemical compounds, perceived winemaking choices. Now that this is very clean, very straightforward. So what's driving it for me, both flavor and aromatically and texturally, is uh, the citrus, the stone, stone fruit, the florality, the acidity. Um, it is bone dry, but note to self, there's an illusion of sweetness that's coming from um, the ripeness of the, especially the stone fruit character, peach, apricot, and that little honeyed note. Acidity to me at this tasting ain't medium plus. It's high, mouthwatering. Uh, no, nothing phenolic to talk about. The texture is lean and tart, but in a very good way. Sometimes tart can telegraph, you know, a negative, uh, excessive thing, but this isn't at all. Actually, the acidity is pushing the finish way out. It is long. Um, and the complexity, you know, medium to medium plus, it's pretty straightforward, but, you know, I, if this is one of those white wines where I'm thinking, gee, a little bit of bottle age, what fun would that be? Uh, gentlemen, did I do okay? You want to opine at all on anything I didn't mention? No, oh, I think, I think you got it. I, yeah. I, the only thing I would just add is that I think the minerality in it, uh, however you want to describe that, is very apparent in the palate, more so than on the nose. Yes. You get that sort of uh, slight grit. Uh, that, that, that you can find there, but brilliant. No, I think so yeah, too. I think actually that's a great point that the minerality is not apparent aromatically, but it is, it is like just dovetailed with the acidity when you take it on, uh, on the palate. So uh, this is my, one of my favorite things about this game, Li Meng, is the uh, right. possible grape varieties. So for those of you who have the wine, you may have already started guessing what it is. I ask you to really play along for learning purposes to pick what you thought it was, even if you do know the answer. And for those of you who don't know the answer, and just by looking at the descriptors, you can absolutely play along. I'm going to launch the poll right now. And you've got four choices here on grape variety. Um, Pinot Blanc, Riesling, Gruner, or Other. And curious to see if you thought Other, uh, what other varieties you um, had in mind. And then of course on region, we do have Old World, Two Old World, Two New World, France and Austria, and then New World, we have Washington and New Zealand. So I'll give you guys a few more seconds, maybe 20 seconds here to play along until I see that everyone's voted. Uh, please take a moment to vote as um, this is anonymous. I was about to say that. Great. Uh, and I, I can see the early signs of in the grape variety between two particular varieties. Um, if you have questions and you're feeling a little lost as to how to even start looking at this picking, please go ahead and enter it into Q&A. And while we're waiting for everyone to fill in the poll, we have a question here from Jerry, Evan, um, that I'm just going to throw at you because I know that this is a pet uh, issue for you. Jerry asks, I was wondering how much does letting the wine open up affect the wine? I heard oh, that older Bordeaux, for example, should breathe for like an hour or two, but I was always confused as to how the wine breath in such a small surface area exposed to, uh, breathes in such a small surface area exposed to air. Yeah, without, without taking too much time, you know, there's an old adage that states, you know, uh, that 20 minutes in the glass is worth six months of bottle age. And while I wouldn't necessarily hold you to that, it does speak to the fact that, that aeration or the, uh, the activation of the aromatic components, the esters and the aldehydes uh, of the wine are 
more active when there's oxygen there. So if you were put in a little bottle like this for, you know, a couple, for 30 days or something, somebody finally unraveled you and put you in a glass, boom, you would explode as well too. We do have our 5, 10, 15, 20 rule, which suggested a minimal uh, 15 minutes uh, would be required, but it's been our collective experience that usually the wines start to sing at about 30 to 45. But um, in general, uh, with very rare exceptions, any wine of quality of gravitas will benefit dramatically from, uh, from some time uh, open, open in the glass um, and swirled around. And I also wanted to answer from the chat, we've got a question saying, I just got my kit yesterday. Can I still taste it today? The answer is absolutely yes. I don't know where you are, but um, I think you are from Vegas. So definitely make sure that it's ice um, chilled down and just really let the wine breathe before you start evaluating. One PS about airtime, and it won't apply to the wines that we taste um, uh, with Master of the World, but if a wine has significant bottle age, you want to actually sometimes err on the side of a little less air in case the wine degenerates, because you don't know how it's going to react to air. But that's going to come into play more when you're dealing with mature wines, either in your restaurant or you're sharing them at home. Great. I'm going to share the poll results. So, um, Madeline, here's what you're going to be talking about. 63% went for the Riesling and 21% um, went from Gruner. And then in the chat, we have people who thought that it may have been Chenin or Albarino or even Sauvignon Blanc. So you've kind of got your work cut out where there were, um, there are different thoughts uh, all together. And then- but, but don't reveal it yet, Lee Mang. That's the only reason I'm, uh, okay, great. I'm, yeah, I'm no stepping on you. Forgive me. And then in terms of region, interestingly, even though there was only 21% of uh, Gruners, the Austria came in very strong at 67%, because huh. obviously you can find varieties there. Um, and then Old World France also came in as a close second. So take it away, Maddie. Well, this is very interesting because thank you for bringing up the Austria business because I bet money that it's not just for Gruner but for Riesling as well. So that split between the two because especially people in the trade, even though there are drips of Austrian Riesling out there, you know, we, we become obsessed with it. I want to bring to everyone's attention that the Pinot Blanc Riesling and Gruner Veltliner, you had as an option, non-aromatic, highly aromatic, and semi-aromatic grape variety. So hold that thought uh, because this will come into play when you're, when you're deducing. And it's a broad stroke, but it's an important stroke. Also, I love the fact that people weighed in with Chenin and Sauvignon Blanc, especially because that speaks to, um, uh, especially with Sauvignon Blanc, highly aromatic, but both of them have significant natural acidity. And then Albarino because of the florality, I would imagine. So this wine is sending a couple, three uh, signals that, uh, that are sensible for you to hang on. So. You know, at the end of the day, though, what is the story being told by the, um, the leading elements in the wine? Should we go ahead and reveal? Yep. Sorry, I got to get rid of the poll. And uh. very cool poll results. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Um, give me a second. Uh, you can reveal it. In I, work. Uh, no, that's fine. I would also say, you know, since I'm chatting, Pinot Blanc um, will have uh, less compelling acidity. Gruner Veltliner um, also can have, you know, significant acidity levels, but the mouthfeel and the structure is important um, to be very specific about it and to quantify it in your own mind. So here we are. It is indeed Riesling. It is indeed from France. It is uh, Hugel. Did I pronounce that correctly, uh, Mr. Goldstein? Yes. Oui, oui. Much better French than I do. This is um, the classic Riesling. It is uh, young, but not a baby, 2017. Um, and I think it's showing like an angel. Uh, I really think it's speaking to the grape variety. And um, why? Why Riesling as opposed to something else? At the end of the day, you know, and if you, why not Austrian Riesling? Excellent. The marker difference. Um, so we've discussed the florality, the type of fruit, green apple and stone fruit all speak to Riesling. The minerality speaks to Riesling, moderate, moderate alcohol in this case. Uh, it doesn't command your attention at all. Why not Austria? And I would say, again, gross generalization, but generally Austrian Rieslings um, at this age would be a little bit more closed, not as forthcoming. This was explosively aromatic. It was, you know, welcoming you to drink it. 
um, I think the minerality component could be even a little bit harder and the fruit is not as um, expressive. You know, I, I find myself when I taste Austrian Riesling that they make me work harder. They pull me into it unless they have, you know, several years bottle age. Uh, gentlemen, would you agree with that? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and the only yeah. other thing I would say, why not, um, why not uh, Germany as opposed to Alsace and actually why not New World? Because what are we talking about when we're talking about quote unquote classic Riesling from the New World? We're really talking about Clare and Eden Valleys in Australia, correct? And you can have very strong minerality on those wines, but that to me is the minerality. I always say that Riesling has a pocket full of rocks, no matter where it's planted, <laughs> uh, even in Northern Michigan, <laughs> you know? So why Alsace as opposed to Germany? Well, I think, again, and probably Tim can speak to this better than me, but you know, broad strokes, not Mosul for sure, because Mosul would be more linear. Um, it would be more lifted, more ballerina-like. It would be less lush. Uh, it would be more delicate. Possibly you could wrestle a little bit with maybe a uh, fault or a warming, warmer growing region um, in Germany. Uh, and also there's another aspect to this wine that I found utterly fascinating because conventional wisdom has it, Alsace Riesling Petrol, AKA TDN. And I really don't get much other than maybe an illusion of it because I'm you know, looking for it in this wine. Mm. So I would say if you had to wrestle, it would be between a warmer growing region in Germany and Alsace. Tim, would you agree with that being the Riesling yeah, um, expert? You know, yeah, you know, you compare it to, to with Claire and Eden Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, those wines generally are about 12 to 12.5% 12 12 alcohol, mm -hmm. very high acid, even higher than this, a very narrow pr fruit profile, and also a lot of TDM, even when the wines are young. Oh, you know, in, in, the in the Australian Australian one, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, TDN really develops in Riesling where you have shorter, warmer growing cycles, and that's Australia. And then in terms of Germany, I guess the closest I want to come to on this is probably Rheinhessen. Uh, it doesn't have the, the elegance and the perfume of, of Rheingau. It doesn't have the richness of the faults. And it certainly, you know, the Balsa wines are much more delicate. So, but what this has that the German wines don't have so much is that it's got a really interesting, unique combination of TDN. I did pick up actually a fair bit on the nose and then earth and mineral together. And usually mm -hmm. in German wines, you don't have so much earth and mineral together. And in Alsace, you really do because you have so many different soil types there. So the, here's a question from Greg. Um, I usually expect more weight on the palate with Alsatian Riesling. Do you find this light body typical? I guess the question first is, do you define this as light body? And is this typical? To me, it's more medium bodied, I think the compelling acidity gives the, you know, impression of lightness because it tightens it up. You know, you start with this forthcoming nose and then the palate is a little bit leaner, which is why I made the comment that I wouldn't mind revisiting this in like, you know, six months, two years and see what it does because I think it'll relax a little. Um, but, you know, I think um, Alsace Riesling to me, it, it, I rarely think of it as being you know, less acidity or, or acid deficient. You know, the grape variety does its structural trick here. Gentlemen, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, great. We it's beautiful wine, straightforward. You mm -hmm. can, by the way, note to self, memorize this. If you're, you know, <laughs> seriously, and, and, and it is not silly that you were considering the other grape varieties at all. You know, one look at the label's worth a thousand bucks. But this is one, especially aromatically, and then the structural um, elements that you can memorize in terms of the bell ringer for the grape variety from the old world. Great. Um, I'm going to now move to the next wine. Uh, yeah. uh. Um, while you're doing that, Li Meng, so I'm going to all take wine too. Um, two comments. First of all, I wish today I could just listen to T Madeline and Tim. I, I could just listen to those guys forever. They got so much wonderful stuff to say. The other thing I wanted to, to just add to all of you, because, you know, I think everyone has this tendency to freak out if you're not finding exactly what is there on the list that's coming out of our mouth, whatever, or even noting at times it might be a slight uh, discrepancy between what you might see on the screen and what's there. Remember that your palate is different every single day. The wine shows different every single day. And this wine was gritted and tasted 
on a specific day with a specific set of people at that time. So we're always going to be in the rough ballpark there, but if it's not nailing 100% exactly tracking with you or today or whatever, that's okay. And don't freak out. And don't, you know, start sweating and, and all that other stuff. We're all good here. So um, I'm going to take one two now, which is an interesting uh, side by side comparison uh, to what we had there. Clearly, there's a difference, you know, uh, first off in the appearance, not, not dramatic, a little bit more um, texture, a little bit more uh, richness, perhaps, in the viscosity of the wine. But the markers themselves for clarity and depth and, and basic color are fairly uh, straightforward. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. What is really um, striking to me about this wine and, and a bit different uh, than the wine that we just came up came off of was this absolute monolithic singularity to the nature of the fruit character that you have here. Sure, there's some very sort of riper uh, elements of, of, of citrus fruit, you know, Meyer lemons and tangerines, that sort of side, as opposed to the you know, bright lemons and all that other stuff uh, that, that you would find normally, and it being more part of the, the, the flesh that's there. But to me, this wine is really defined by the, the vine and tree fruit, and particularly the pear elements that really um, sing here. You get the the yellow brown, you get the green, you get the riper uh, yellow apple, but just this sort of singularity, this monochromatic voice uh, that's there. Definite stone fruit elements here, whether you want to call it peaches, whether you want to call it nectarines, that's certainly up to you. And um, at the same time, sort of the sharp notes of it, but the ripe notes of it at the same time. So if you conflate those together, you're getting a very distinctive, but again, very, very pure um, expression of fruit character that's there. As you go into uh, trying it, moving on to the next slide, uh, there are, are, are without question some tropical notes there. And again, they tend to lean more melony for me than not. And both on the fresh side, but a little bit on the riper side, um, same sort of uh, fruit blossomy character uh, that you have there. And there is sort of a subtle undertone of, you know, call it elderflower, call it honeysuckle-ish, whatever you want, but there's sort of a very brighter expressive floral character there, very much on the fresh side no veggies to speak of whatsoever. And then that whole sort of sweeter aromatic element of herbals. So the verbenas, the chamomiles, um, you know, for some people, they, they, they find sorrel at once sharp and citric, but also a little bit greener and sweet at the same time. Um, no real sense of, of organic earth. And, and then while there is a notion of sort of a stoniness or a rockiness there, if you go back now and try it side by side against the first wine, Boy, it shows you how, how deficient relative it is in comparison, although there's certainly um, some elements there. Clearly no oak on this wine. I'd be surprised if it uh, kissed a toothpick at any point in its life. And please note that a lot of these things that we point out here are perceptions. So we're not sitting there tracking to a, a tech sheet when we write these things. We're doing it as you are. What's your perception of it might be? So while I don't think there is, it could be that there's larger, older uh, wood there, but it really feels um, from the cleanliness of it, the nature of the acid, that it's probably all stainless steel. A um, little bit of, uh, of peanut shelliness, um, maybe a little bit of Lee's stuff there, maybe a little bit of a uh, whole cluster or something like that in there. Um, and then in the palate, Boom, you know, you've got the wine showing bright acid. Uh, again, sort of balanced, slightly more generous alcohol, particularly when you compare it to the first wine. Nice and long, uh, lean and bright. Um, and again, sort of very, a very um, uh, uh, opera-esque sort of one voice speaking uh, profile there. So great. that's what I picked up. So we're gonna get on with the poll and um, I'm gonna tell my panelists that we did take a while on the first wine. So we're gonna speed up a little bit on the rest and uh, fast fingers of the poll if you can. No, don't be apologetic. We're all good. So here's the second poll. If you guys could take a moment um, to uh, submit your answers. Uh, Pinot Gris Riesling Rhone blend, a white Rhone blend uh, versus other. And again, if it's other, or if you have questions, please throw that into the question and answer section. And then you get two old world, France versus Italy, and then two new world, Australia versus Oregon. And I can already see that there is quite a, a polarizing, um, thing going on in region between old world and new world being France versus Oregon. And uh, so Evan, you can be prepared for that. And there's also quite a polarizing Pinot Gris versus Rhone blend uh, that we're seeing here. Another 20 seconds and then I will uh, turn off the poll and share the results. Uh, in our chat, we are also hearing maybe Albarino um, or Alvarino from Vinaverde. Um, as a potential contender. Yeah. 
all of those are interesting choices um, that, that are there. It'll be interesting to see when the results actually uh, come up and we can, we can sort of lead into that. Uh, it looks like um, there's an interesting split. Uh, it, clearly the Pinot Gris quote unquote have it here. Um, and for people who are very familiar with that grape, regardless of, of point of origin, there's, there's, a, there's some compelling arguments to be made there. The sort of real um, bright fruit character on it, that, that sort of rich roundness there, um, definitely can speak a little bit to the Rhone grapes. Um, Riesling, particularly coming off of that Riesling, if you taste them side by side, a little bit harder there. And then the old world, uh, France and the, the, the new world, Oregon, that's an interesting thing to hold on to, particularly as we, uh, as we actually talk about the wine and we can address it. So, um, Li Meng, what do we, have here. You want to show the results yet? Let's do it. Yeah, and I'll talk through it as we're, uh, we're doing it. Um, this is another one that I think is a really uh, strong um, uh, example of what it is. And this is a Pinot Gris. Uh, it's from the, the great estate of the Campbell's uh, Oak Cove uh, Vineyards up in, uh, in Oregon in the Willamette Valley 2018 vintage. Now, what's, what's interesting here when you go over it is realize, of course, this is a grape that is universal. But for those of you who spent time around it, there's a very different expression of Pinot Gris as we know it in Italy as Pinot Grigio coming from the Northeast, um, from France, where it comes from Alsace, where our Riesling just did, and then um, in Oregon, as well as obviously other parts of the United States. We have a tendency to think about it across um, uh, really as an Oregonian thing, but respectfully about 90% of it is planted in the state of California. But I don't think necessarily all of the expressions we have are as uh, signature as what you see in Oregon. What's interesting about Italy uh, is Italy's tend to be leaner, meaner, uh, higher acid, bright, not nearly as, um, this, not to say this is like uber unctuously textured, but, but comparatively um, they're bright. It's also, it doesn't have clonal diversity. They pretty much work only with the Colmar uh, clone in, uh, in Italy. So the wines tend to be sort of very straightforward, lean, bright, sharp. Uh, we all know what that's all about. In France, it tends to be completely the opposite, of course, because coming from Alsace, the wines tend to be fleshier. They tend to be richer. They tend to be rounder. From an appearance standpoint, they can either be pinker or grayer uh, in color as well, too, from a pigmentation standpoint. Um, and oftentimes, they tend to be a little bit uh, sweeter, both by the fact that they're there are a lot of people who make Pinot Gris who do leave a little, little bit of residual sugar in it, uh, not necessarily making it of Vendage Tardif or anything, but just simply leaving sugar there, which is going to give you added texture and richness to it and, uh, and, and, and soften up the wine a bit. So they tend to be a little bit creamier. This wine doesn't have that. Um, to me, it tends to be a little bit leaner and brighter. Uh, so then it kind of fits that tweener thing. So it's got the really wonderful expressive fruit, but it's not the lean, mean mineral uh, bandit that we had before. So I kind of usually end up in Oregon when, uh, when that's the, the case here. Um, and also it, it, it uh, you know, doesn't have necessarily the weight uh, that you're gonna get with Rhone varieties. So for the person who said Rhone earlier, those wines tend to be fleshier and more generous in alcohol. This wine's at about 13 and a half. At least that's what the label says. Uh, most Rhone wines to get that level of expression of fruit, you're probably pushing closer to, um, to 14. Uh, I, I think what's, um, to me, the giveaway for this wine is that pear note. You know, for me, when I think Pinot Gris and pear together, that screams Oregon and it screams Willamette Valley. I usually pick up some ginger, um, maybe a little bit of melon uh, that we talked about earlier and a little bit of the, uh, the peach and apricot thing. Um, what's important to remember is this was a very hot year, 2018, um, a very warm, very sunny. So while it wasn't per se as hot as 16 and 17 in that part of the world, nevertheless, it was riper and richer, which, uh, which I think reflects itself in uh, its presentation. Great. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions here apart from um, the Albarino. And since we're running a little behind on time, I'm going to go ahead and go to wine three with Tim. Oh, we can come back to that if we have time later. Yeah. That's a good question, I'm sure. Okay. Hi, everybody. Greetings from New Mexico. Behind the Adobe curtain. Uh, Evans was asking earlier today, it's, uh, it's actually not as hot today in New Mexico as it is in the Bay Area. It's only 98. So the difference, in, and I was telling was that we have air conditioning. <laughs> I lived in San Francisco for 30 years, no air conditioning in the heat. All right, so wine number three. Uh, my glass, for some reason, has some bubbles. Who knows? That may be some CO2 added before bottling. But uh, let's take it through the site. It is definitely very bright. It's not in the straw range as far as color. I would say it is literally a medium yellow. There's a touch of green and there's also a touch of silver, okay? And then on the nose, 
just everybody take a moment and um, <laughs> we've gone we've gone from as Maddie said a pretty expressive aromatic grape to uh, a non-aromatic grape to one that's fully aromatic okay we call that this is a RuPaul camp of wine grapes okay so this is highly floral uh, but before that we get to the floral let's talk about the fruit so it's a combination of if, lots of different things one it is sweet and tart citrus so you've got mandarin and orange and tangerine combined with a little you know lime and and then in terms of vine fruit it is very ripe apple and brown or yellow pear but really a lot of stone fruit. So peach and apricot, I get both white and yellow peach on this and some apricot and very fresh and ripe. And a little custardy, I uh, uh, think that's probably Lee's contact. Okay, Lee Ming, next slide please. Mm -hmm. And then uh, smelling it, there's a lot of tropical fruit, especially mango and pineapple. Uh, what else on this, you know, orange melon, uh, candy, fleshy, fruity, really intensely ripe, uh, but also a little few tart elements. And now we come to me, which is one of the most important parts of the wine, because there are lots of white wines that have a ton of fruit, but this one has, it's incredibly floral. So honeysuckle, gardenia, jasmine, citrus blossom, very fresh. And then there are, are hints of vegetative herbal type notes, not so much vegetative for me today, but definitely the rubina, a little bit of saffron, a little bit of fresh chamomile, not dried, uh, some honey, even honeysuckle. Uh, you might be tempted to say, well, honey, honeysuckle could be botrytis, but I don't get any other notes for it here. Uh, no real earth or mineral to speak of, or maybe a touch of, of rockiness, stoniness. Uh, oak aging, if it's there, it is uh, used at best. So there's some very subtle spices and oxidative notes going on and no you know, chemical things going on. But the important thing to notice is uh, on my glass, there's definitely least contact and some malactic going on here. Okay, so everybody, why don't you go ahead and taste it, please. I'm gonna mute so I don't. Is Tim's tasting final on structure? Mm. Okay, so here we are on the structure. It is dry. The alcohol gives the perception of sweetness, but to, for me, the true measure of sweetness, dryness is the finish. And also just to, you know, just a heads up, I think it's a good practice when you're going to assess structure. And I'm writing about this now for a future blog post and actually a book. Uh, retaste the wine and wait three to five seconds because for most people it's delayed response. It's a delayed bodily response. Okay, the acid here is medium plus at best, you know, some salivation, but not a lot. The alcohol is medium plus bordering on high. The wine on the finish is I would say medium phenolics. So again, the combination of floral and phenolics puts it in the fully aromatic grape and all of a sudden your universe should have gotten much narrower on what the grape could be. The texture is really round, creamy, and smooth. And I'm attributed to that to not only, you know, the quality of the fruit, but also Lee's contact and also maybe some elevated alcohol. Uh, the finish is medium plus and the complexity, I would say, yeah, medium plus to high. This is a really beautifully made wine. Okay, so nice. let's, let's go to the... Uh, the Jeopardy board and say, what could it be? Okay, so what do we have? Okay, so we've got a choice of three grape varieties, Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, and Dionier, and then other, if you want to write in. Uh, and then we're asking, of course, you know, old world, new world, and what drives the wine. Okay, so please take it away, cast your ballots, and we'll see what happens. I'm definitely seeing a lot of movement um, between old world and new world. I think, mm. Tim, it might be helpful to, when we reveal the wine, to talk about why it was okay. distinctly one versus the other between sure. old world France and mm -hmm. old world California. Um, there's definitely a lot of votes for Viognier, but um, Gewürztraminer comes a distant second. So mm. um, given how different Gewürztraminer is from Viognier, I think it'll be interesting, especially for those of you who did pick Gewürztraminer, um, it might be interesting to hear from you guys as to why you went that route um, to help us out uh, in, in explaining uh, the kit. So in just about 10 seconds, I will close the voting and share the results. And any questions, again, please do put it into Q&A, and we're here to answer your questions. So here are the results. 67% uh, thought that it was Viognier. 
Um, and again, we've got Wutzwina uh, coming a, a distant second. And then in terms of region, we've got neck and neck, New World, California, and Old World, France, almost split quite evenly. So Tim, okay. uh, should I reveal first, or do you want to talk about what led you one way versus the other? Well, okay. Um... Looking at this, uh, let's go ahead and do it for this, then you can reveal. So everybody, I just want to point out that, you know, the, the magic combination of floral and the phenolic bitterness should take you away from Chardonnay. Chardonnay is a very neutral grape. What does, what might point you to Chardonnay is the fact that it's got both ML and least contact, okay? And also uh, the perception of oak, but not too much, okay? So we're going to, that's for Chardonnay. Gewürztraminer. demeanor. How, how is it not Gewürztraminer? Why could it be Gewürztraminer? I would just say, again, those two winemaking type techniques, least contact and malolactic Burgundian Chardonnay type techniques that are used for other grapes, including Viognier, are rarely used on Gewürztraminer. And Gewürztraminer, you know, if anything, it's like, you know, turning up the volume to 11 in terms of aromatic grapes. It's just so flamboyant, intense, powerful. Um, I might also structurally be too, right, Tim? Yeah, structurally uh, you know, too. Acidity so. and sweetness issues with Gewurz as opposed to uh, Viognier. Forgive me yeah. for interrupting. Yeah, no, thanks. That's perfect because uh, to Maddie's point, you know, there would be less acid in this wine for Gewurz. You may probably elevated alcohol, and I might even be looking for some botrytis as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Tim, uh, sorry, on the Gewürztraminer, the people who are guessing that were led there by the floral uh, elements as well as the lychee elements. Did you get those um, elements as well? I didn't get lychee so much. I certainly got floral. But remember, there's a family of aromatic grapes that includes things like muscat in various forms and also torrentes from Argentina. So, you know, you have to use other impact compounds and also structure to narrow the playing field. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, Gewürztraminer to me, more alcohol, less acid, and no winemaking, no least contact. Or if it is, it's just overwhelmed by the fruit. Okay. Uh, everybody who thinks this is from France needs to taste wine one again. <laughs> do that right now. This is a great A-B comparison. One of these things is not like the other. Okay, and, and of course, you know, why number one, the reason is going to be, as they say in France, je suis shocking. It's going to be shocking because of the acidity, but also it's intensely earthly and minerally, and it has TDM. Yeah. All right, so uh, Lee Meng, let's reveal the wine. Okay. Survey says, okay, I get it. Do you, do you get rid of the pole? Okay, here we go. So this is oh, the... Right. Go ahead, please. The Minor Family Paso Robles Viognier 2018 Vintage. Mm. All right, everybody. This to me is, is textbook California Viognier. More often than not, you've got wines, though, that do have some new oak. I can thank some of some longtime producers uh, like Calera and Alban, who use quite a bit of oak. But this one has little if any probably some used oak i know it's stainless steel ferment uh but what makes it viognier you know it is definitely in the aromatic family with lots of floral lots the whole cornucopia of different fruit and some phenolic bitterness uh to me why i couldn't take it to france a couple other reasons one you know if you think about viognier in france if it's of any quality odds are you're talking about uh Condry. and if that's the case you're talking about expensive French oak, okay? Because more often than not, they're using small breaks, which are very expensive, that lend that whole, you know, subset of aromas and flavors. So, and also, you know, country to me is intensely stony in terms of minerality and maybe not even this much alcohol, but I find this is a really pretty example of Central Coast Viognier and spot on for the variety. Yeah, if I could, yeah, if I could just jump in here, you know, what, what, what makes this one, and very much as Madeline said earlier, for those of you who are trying to like hit the save drive and, and drop something upstairs, this is a really textbook example of what uh, Viognier from California uh, should be. So often, as we all know, because we've all been burned off by them, they tend to be these sort of like soapy Walgreens princess uh, shampoo things that you <laughs> buy your 12-year-old daughter uh, that come in a fluorescent pink bottle, and they're just so over the top and st sticky sweet and all that. This one has all of the telltale markers of Viognier in terms of the fruit character, in terms of the balanced phenolics and all that, but um, not with the over-the-top, um, you know, heavy-duty extract that you have there. So it's, it's interesting to me how some of you did end up 
um, in France. France's VNEs tend to show a little bit more, um, I don't want to use necessarily the word restraint, but they're not as opulent as ours are. They, they, they tend to be um, very much chiseled uh, in the same flavor profile that's there. And they often, oftentimes, because of the nature of the fruit ripeness, tend to be a bit more phenolic by nature. Um, this is, you know, I, I think a really um, just lovely example of, um, of what Viognier can be like when it's done right. And for all those people, I always tell people that when you have a Viognier like this, um, it makes you forget all of the pain that you had to get through to get to this place there because you have to get a lot of pain to, to have one that's as well made as this one is. I want to yeah. comfort there. There's more than one person out there that was convinced it was Gewürztraminer. This doesn't mean that you're way off. You know, there's a lot of commonality, particularly in the aromatics and the mouthfeel. You know what spoke California to me, actually, and then pushed me into... Um, Viognier even more was I do taste vanilla on this wine. The presence of mm. oak is mm -hmm. obvious to me, but not annoying. You know, it speaks in that respect more new world. And I agree with Evan completely. Were it contrary, it would be more restrained. It would be a little bit tighter. It wouldn't be kind of forthcoming. But those of you who went the Gewurz route, you know, California Viognier is a little bit louder to me than French Viognier. So hold that thought. <laughs> so I can um, see yeah. where you'd veer into Gewurz land, right? Yeah, you know, I'm looking at these questions, so I want to answer a couple of them. Uh, Eugene, uh, just say, you know, you, you think about quality, and I'm not, this is a 30,000 foot statement. You think about quality, Gewurz demeanor, and certainly the grape is grown all over the planet. A lot of people do a good job with it, but the best wines come from Alsace, okay? And by and large, they are weighty. They are 13, 14, 14 and a half percent alcohols. Mm -hmm. They have residual sugar. They have a lot of phenolic bitterness. Mm -hmm. They're incredibly floral. More often than not, they have botrytis. And they're even a different color. They're yellow, really deep yellow, almost gold compared to this. So this has just so much more restraint, okay? And then Jerry, Kim asked, how do you perceive winemaking choices? So Jerry, to me, this smells like yeast and bread dough and a little bit of butter. So the yeast bread dough to me thing is least contact. Mm -hmm. And the butter, of course, is diacetyl from uh, malolactic, okay? Great, perfect. Thank you, Tim. I love that you're multitasking there. Um, <laughs> we're gonna go on to the next wine. That's Tim too. It is Tim too. So Tim, Tim we're gonna have you do- Rock on, Tim. Number four. <laughs> Okay, everybody, going to uh, red wine here. And everybody, as you pick up the glass, I mean, notice that this is a, a lighter pigmented, thinner skin, great, okay? So obviously your universe just got much smaller, but let's talk about it. So it is definitely bright, reflects light in the glass and on the surface underneath, uh, yeah, and it's clear. You can read through it. Again, so a thinner skin, great. Uh, it is a lighter ruby and just a hint of garnet for me around the edges. So maybe a little bit of development happening. Mm -hmm. And then on the nose, all right, so it's predominantly red fruit. Okay, so I would say there is red cherry that's sour, there's cranberry, pomegranate, there's dried red plum. So again, that's my comment about the color connecting the dots is there's a little bit of development here because most of the fruit is tart and it's fresh leaning towards dry okay so just a little bit of evolution uh what else about this no blue fruit uh, i have to think about but usually if there's blueberry in the wine it's like bluish purple in color just mm -hmm. just a thought okay like malbec um also no black fruit uh there actually is a little citrus fruit to me there's a little dried orange peel in this wine the nose is really quite complex okay Li Ming, mm -hmm. please okay and then uh, floral, yes, to me, there's rose petals and jasmine bordering on dried now, fresh. I don't know how long ago this was initially tasted. No green vegetal notes. There's definitely some herbal notes. I like star anise a lot. Definitely some ginger root, tomato leaf, not too much. Uh, some dried basil, yeah. And so there's some dry, savory type herbs, but they're very subtle here. To me, what I get a very strong impression of, at least today, is black tea. Black tea and or dried orange rind, which reminds me of certain teas, okay? Uh, organic earth, to me, not dominant, but there is some soil and dust and a little bit of rock. To me, the fruit here in the scale of fruit and earth, the fruit is still, you know, much more intense and more prominent. Okay, no animal, uh, oak aging, yes, I think moderate use of oak and you know, this is a mix of predominantly used oak, but there's some definitely new oak spices and those are vanilla and brown baking spices. Also a little bit of toast. All right, uh, anything else? Uh, for me, I found some stem inclusion in the wine. Ha, that's important, okay? In a lighter, you know, colored, uh, thinner skin grape wine. Okay, 
Great. Onward. Before you move on to um, structure, Tim, uh, we have a question here about what are you specifically tasting in structure? So if you can go on structure a little slowly to help this um, particular okay. attendee out. It's funny because that's actually the next blog post I'm writing. So I'm going to go ahead and, and mute myself Great. and taste. Great. And the question for everybody is, can you talk a bit about structure? What are you specifically tasting when you're looking at structure? So uh, thanks, it's a great question. So now that I'm tasting for structure, I put everything, all those things to the side. And first and foremost, I'm parsing, I'm separating out physical sensations. Uh, and I'm gonna start with alcohol. So alcohol, I'm connecting to the ripeness of the fruit and the fruit is generally tart. But when I check for alcohol, I say, oh, and I, after I spit out the wine, important point, I say, oh, and inhale. And the heat here I get is literally right about here. So this wine, in the pantheon of red wines from around the planet is really medium at best. It's probably 12 and a half percent alcohol and there's a lot of tart fruit. Okay, acidity is next and that to me is salivary glands. And, and if you have restrained alcohol, you've got higher acid, period. That's how it works because obviously you've got grapes that don't fully ripen and if they don't fully ripen, they're tart, they're, they're underripe, right? So the acid to me salivary glands. I can feel this in the front of my mouth and my teeth, tongue, and gums. So the acid is really elevated for a red wine. And then we're tasting red, so we're talking about tannin. And tannin, of course, tannic acid from either grape skins or barrels. To me, this is very moderate tannin, okay? And it's interesting when you juxtapose that to the acidity level, but I'm getting, you know, some, a little bit of grape tannins in the front of the mouth and a little bit of oak tannins. And remember, I said predominantly used oak. So this wine has moderate tannins at best. So we've got a wine that's medium in alcohol, bordering on high in acid, and then medium in tannin. Hmm. Okay, and think about that in the, in the context of thinner skin, lighter colored red wines that are red fruit dominant, okay? With that, how did I do? Medium plus acid, medium alcohol, medium, to me, medium tannin today, and a lean tart texture. And the texture you should judge not by how the wine enters the mouth, but the finish. To me, that's how I always judge. And the finish, yeah, I would say is long, and the complexity is medium plus. This is really well-made wine. Okay. Was that okay? Did I do yeah, okay? Yeah, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to launch this poll. And we're gonna be looking at wine four. So you'll have a set of different choices. Uh, Gamay Noir, Pinot Noir, Sangiovese, or other. Again, please put other into the chat box or in Q&A. And then on region, uh, Tim, I, I'm seeing that it's kind of uh, split. Everybody started out with all four regions, Old World France, Old World Italy, New World Oregon, and New World New Zealand. Mm. Remain, there was one comment that maybe Tim can speak to. Yep. You know, it's not always easy to tell the difference between old world and new world. What are the broad strokes? What are we perceiving that shoves us in one direction yeah, or another? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and just to clarify, Tim, specifically, uh, what Jerry is asking is he's been taught that new world fruit is, uh, new world is fruitier and old world is earthier. Is that mm -hmm. how you see the world of evaluating? Uh, that's one way to do it. But Jerry, the, the thing is, is about this particular wine, because you've got a little bit of both going on here, but you also have to take into account, you know, you know, the quality of the fruit and the fruit here is very tart. So this is a cool climate wine, wherever it's from. So keep that in mind. But yeah, that's where you start. And then sometimes as with this wine, you got to dig a little deeper. And, and for me, I just tasted it again. And for me, the wine is predominantly fruity. So. Great. And I'm going to end the poll in just five seconds. In the meantime, Catherine is asking, Tim, is this a drink, uh, age this or drink now? Uh, this wine to me, first of all, it's, got a, it's probably about three years old plus, and I think it's got five to seven years easily. And if you like to drink old wines, because the answer really depends on you, this wine could easily age seven to 10 years, but it depends on you. Great. I'm going to share the results. Um, so we have an overwhelming... Uh, 73 percent on Pinot Noir uh, and Sangiovese and Gamay Noir did get some votes not a lot and then in terms of region we do have it split quite evenly between Oregon and New Zealand um, and then of uh, and France. So I think you could spend more time maybe talking about how is it not Pinot Noir from any of these other regions. Okay. Do you want to go to wine first or? 
no, 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 no. Let's, let's do these grape varieties first and then we'll go to the regions. Then let's do the grape varieties and then why don't you reveal the wine, okay? So Gambay Noir, you're talking probably about Beaujolais and if it's this color, probably Beaujolais Village. Uh, what's missing for that is obviously carbonic maceration, uh, even though this wine does have stem inclusion in carbonic and this is even the wrong color for a wine with carbonic, which is usually red with bluish tinges in it. Why is it that Sangiovese, uh, you know, the structure is wrong. So the, the, the acid is not high enough and it's certainly not tannin because if you think about Sangiovese, Sangiovese has a lot of grape tannin in the front of your mouth and it's very acidic. Also star anise and tomato and tomato leaf. And I look for those things and it's chalky, especially if it's Chianti Classico. Uh, if it's the other wines, if it's Brunello, it would be a bigger wine, much more oxidative and more oak influence probably and higher alcohol. Okay. Uh, all right. So why don't we reveal the wine and talk about why it is. Great. And as I'm doing from. that, Tim, can you also explain from Catherine what marker actually got you to stem inclusion? You've mentioned it a couple of times. Uh, so what is the stem inclusion marker? All right. So Catherine, great question. So if you are fermenting whole clusters of grapes, you still have stems, right? And the marker for stem inclusion is literally a green, like twiggy, stemmy, hard tannin. And usually for me, that's in the mid palate. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, and that being said, you know, obviously, depending on how ripe the grapes are, you know, stems get ripe too. They can either be grim or the, what's called lig lignification where they turn brown. Okay, so this does have that hard stemmy quality in the mid palate to me. Okay, so here we are. Ah, a beautiful example of New Zealand Pinot Noir, and this is from uh, North Canterbury. It's about an hour north of Christchurch, so this is South Island. So before we go to the other places, why is it from here and not Otago and not Martinboro? Okay, Martinboro has the oldest vines for Pinot Noir in New Zealand. That is the southern end of the North Island. To me, they are the most forward and complex uh, out of all the New Zealand Pinot Noirs at this point. Uh, why is it not Otago? To me, there's not enough fruit, right? So this to me, and Evan and I were talking about this, is a really savory Pinot Noir, which by the way, is going to take it to New Zealand. And savory for me being herbal and also uh, floral and on, on the verge of being gamey. And also it lacks a little bit of fruit. And if it had more fruit, I would be tempted to take it in Oregon. And it has not nearly enough earthiness for Burgundy. It just doesn't. And it also, and don't get me wrong, but it doesn't quite have the pedigree I would expect of a Burgundy with this intensity of fruit. Guys? It's very exotic do? though. I yeah, think it, it is. did A++, it really plus, is. but I would have put it in New Zealand just out of you know deduction and elimination. Uh, yeah. because it's not Burgundy, not Oregon. It's certainly not somewhere that I can think of in California. And there's an exotic element to this wine that I think is very yeah. compelling. And I think to me, the only, the only time you're going to get, for lack of better words, the more fruit balmy character out of uh, New Zealand Pinot Noirs is going to be A, in, in riper vintages, and B, really in Marlborough. You know, Otago doesn't give it to you. Canterbury doesn't give it to you. Uh, Wiper doesn't get, I mean, none of the other regions do. They tend to be more restrained. They tend to be savory. It's interesting to me that, that, that you know, the two highest areas were um, France and New Zealand, because to me, the one that, that, that comes closest, and again, it's a relative term, but comes closest to France regularly is going to be uh, New Zealand. Um, part of that's the cooler climate. There's no area that produces wine that's more than, you know, 52 miles uh, from the ocean. So they're having to have that longer growing season, uh, that brighterness. And then the fruit character just tends not to be uh, as balmy. It, it tends to be more, as, as Tim said earlier, savory, um, you know, a little bit more of the, 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 the stem tannins and things like that. Uh, but again, a, a, a lovely example. Yeah, you know, and I want to I want to answer Eugene's question because he thought it was Sangiovese. Uh, Eugene, that you know, let's just take a good quality Chianti Classico and put it next to this. First of all, the color is going to be even more oxidative. The wine is going to be more acidic, and it's going to be more tanning. And there's going to be tannin in the front of your mouth. This is a perfect example of of doing what I call the Coravin practice. So tasting wines in pairs, and, and again, what I call the evil dwarves. Right. So there's a group of red wines and a group of white wines. And the red wines that are red fruit dominant are also different, 
But if you put this wine next to Chianti Classico and you taste it in a pair and you use your Coravin and, and you're able to do that several times in let's just say three to five to seven days, your brain's gonna snap and you're gonna get it. Because to me, this is really, really different from Chianti Classico, which by the way, would be intensely earthy and minerally as well, okay? But to your point, Tim, it's that perfect balance that Sangiovese yes. often has between the acidity and the tannin that I can't yep. think of another grape variety that does that. So it's Agreed. not necessarily hard tannin, but it's significant amount. So to me, Sangiovese, a lot of times the thumbprint is the mouthfeel and that tension between acid and tannin. Yeah, just one last thing. I want to answer this question because Brandon asked that there's a confected quality uh, to the fruit that reminds him of Grenache. And so, mm -hmm. Brandon, just think about Grenache and where it's grown, especially in the Southern Rhone and how hot it is there. And you've always got, first of all, it's blended, but also it's got 14.5 and above alcohol and it's got tannin. So, okay. Great. Okay, so... Um, I think we should go on to the next two wines because we have two more to go and we have about half an hour left. And I want to make sure that we go back to some of the original questions. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm still sitting here with the evil dwarf comment. I find that oh, <laughs> that was just precious. We need a hat. Use, a hat. Yeah, we need <laughs> an evil dwarf hat to go with it uh, as well. Um, I, I want to come back before I jump into wine five with just a quick comment that, that Madeline had made about the sort of um, exoticness of uh, some of the spicing there, whether you call it sandalwood or a patchouli esque character and incensey sort of thing. There's definitely something that uh, for those of us who remember the 60s, um, that was a smell that, that was in the air as you were doing your whirling dervish around the uh, room listening to the great Grateful Dead. So there's definitely a, an element to that. Um, in the words of- I'm um, sorry, uh, Evan, one, yeah. one, sorry, one quick thing. Um, if those of you who are asking questions and putting comments can do it into the Q&A, we can share that with everybody. Uh, our team in the background is moving things from chat to Q&A, but it will be a lot easier if you just dropped it into Q&A and that way we can uh, get those questions answered and recorded uh, for everyone else who wasn't able to attend. Thank you, Evan. Go for yeah, it. No, no worries. Um, as, uh, Monty Python says, and now for something completely different. We're going to move to wine five now, and um, wine four and five couldn't be in the, in the spectrum of red wines more different, I think, in, in so many regards. So if you pick it up, just the, de the depth, the volume, the intensity of appearance um, is rich. It's, it is deep in color. It's, it is a rubyish sort of color, but it, it just shares so much more uh, concentration, uh, much more pixels, if you will, uh, within it, but a lot of deepness, a lot of uh, richness to it. And that pigment, when I start thinking about that, um, Tim was talking about you know the lack of pigment in a certain family of grapes. When I start thinking pigments of this level, I also think of certain families of grapes, growing cycles, places in the world, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this has an extraordinary uh, combination of red and, and black fruit on it. And um, it's, you know, whatever you want to call it there, you know, currants and plums and cherries, uh, if you want to call it black currants and black figs and all that. It's very, very important. But what's really interesting is the, um, is literally the, uh, the, the, again, portfolio spectrum rainbow, if you will, of conditions across these fruit. Because in one respect, they're very fresh, they're very ripe, and there's a, and there's a freshness to the presentation of the fruit. But clearly that sort of, um, and, you know, and I think it's also important to sort of stress at times that people use the word jammy baked. That doesn't mean like jam or baked or whatever. It just means a warmer character of fruit uh, that we find there. And to me, I definitely pick up that, which often suggests to me either a riper or a longer uh, growing season to make that happen. Not a lot of citrus fruit, not a lot of stone fruit today. Didn't really pick up anything there. But then as you move into the, uh, the, the, the other elements for the non-fruit characters there, uh, boy, there's a lot of floral going on. And I think floral to me is, is uh, uh, definitely a hallmark um, to this varietal when it's done the correct way. Um, both combination of, of, of fresh, uh, fresh uh, florals and some dried florals as well too, which speaks in the same vein to that same characteristic that we got in sort of the, 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 the sort of jammy or baked character of fruit also would obviously lend itself to a more dried character of, of floral. Um, some greens, uh, that's a very strong element of this wine's personality, both that sort of sense of chard and other leafy greens that you might have, mustard greens, things like that, to um, sort of the peppers and, and jalapenos, serranos, pasillas, whatever you find at the grocery store on that day, a little bit of green olive. 
I also like the sort of juxtaposition too, that when I say green, you know, people also again green and they start freaking out. I mean, certain varieties have greener elements as part of their personality. It's part of who they are and what they are and part of their DNA. But this wine also shares a lot of other darker things. I mean, to me, the sun-dried tomatoes really jump out to me today. The beet, the purple beets, the brown uh, mushrooms really jump out. And then the, the herbals, particularly tobacco, particularly tea leaf, uh, jump off. And again, that peppercorn sort of tying the thread back to some of that green element that you had earlier. Um, some earthiness that, that, that's strong there. And then a nice balance of oak. I think the oak in this case is absolutely um, precision uh, made for the quality of fruit here. So it's there, it's got an imprint, it's got some of the sweeter elements, a little bit of that sort of bitterness. Uh, astringency that you could get from coffee beans, but the sweetness from the cloves and the baking spices, touch of nut elements, almost sort of like, uh, uh, for those of you who are down in Nola, a little bit of that kind of pecani uh, thing that you might find there, no specific um, uh, chemical components. And then in the mouth, I'm going to taste, I'm not going to meet because I can't do that, Tim, I'm not that coordinated. It's a generous wine. Um, you've got uh, richness, not necessarily generous in terms of alcohol, because the wine doesn't come off to me as being particularly warm or hot, but generous in terms of its body. Um, the acid, again, that freshness that we pointed out before might be a little bit of a confusion because you've got really fresh, bright acid and not a natural acid, not like a sigillated baby aspirin acid, uh, but also you've got that sort of very dense uh, quality of fruit and a little bit of that jamminess to it. So it's an interesting thing and speaks over time as we reveal what the wine is to what that's all about. Um, the tannins are medium plus uh, for sure. Uh, I wouldn't put them any higher than that. And depending on your palate and your tannin uh, measurements in your mouth, it might be more like medium. A little bit grittier and astringent. I'd say that not of anything just because of the way the tannins are out right now. Uh, medium plus to longer finish. A lot going on in this wine. Okay. So we got some interesting choices, I suspect, here as we pull the poll up. Um, and um, we've got Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, many parts of the world, Tempranillo, many parts of the world, Carmenere, fewer parts of the world, but still uh, from China to Chile to wherever you can find it. And then of course your choices of other. And our old world selection options are France, uh, seems to be everywhere today, France, right? Uh, Spain, and then in the new world, uh, a combination of either Washington State in the Northern Hemisphere and Chile down in the Southern Hemisphere. Given how the results are skewing here, I think this may have been one of the easier wines of the flight. Oh, uh, I'm, I wonder I how people. <laughs> I, I I wonder how people feel about that. If this was an easy wine for this particular flight, um, I mean, Evan, wouldn't you say that we try to give at least a couple that are easier and recognizable? Uh, well, I think also it speaks, you know, to the to diligence that the panels put into uh, ensuring that the examples that we pick are really good examples of what they are. And um, if we end up where we think we are, and if we end up and this becomes easy, I'm delighted because what it suggests to me is that people are understanding uh, this great more than maybe they used to do, as well as it's being um, made uh, in, a, in a better way. But until I see what the poll results are, it'd be hard for me to, to know that. Yeah, or either that or I spoke too soon because the befuddled is coming in. <laughs> ah, befuddled is always good. So, so so here I am. I'm going to share the results. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple of, I see that the, the number of people voting is slow. I think the early voters went straight for it. Um, so we have, uh, it's really running between Cabernet, Tempranillo, and Carmenere. Um, there is a, a strong contingent for Carmenere, but Tempranillo and Cabernet are definitely contenders. So I think you do need to explain why not Cabernet or Tempranillo. Um, as well as um, in terms of region, going along with the variety, it's just kind of everywhere now. Breaking between, yeah, yeah, Chile, Spain, um, and France. So I'm going to yeah. end the poll. I'm going to yeah. share the results. Yeah, and if we're doing that, um, I, I think what's interesting here, and it looks like, you know, the, 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 the Carmen, Carmenere is one, and Carmenere and Cabernet, as we know, are in the same family. So if you actually add those two together, 
three quarters of the people are ending in there. Tempranillo for me, um, while the acid speaks, uh, speaks to it possibly, and the um, nature of the fruit speaks to it possibly, I don't think unless um, your, my colleagues know some places that I don't, you don't pick up as many green elements in Tempranillo. Usually it's more about the bright fruit. You do get um, what the, the uh, Spanish call that sort of balsamico character, which is gonna be minty and herbal and this and that, but there are some definitely underlying greener elements here that speak more to the Cabernet slash Cabernet family than it would the, uh, the, the Tempranillo family. Um, and then obviously to your point, things have kind of uh, pushed all over the place. A lot of it probably is reflective of where you actually voted. Although, um, you know, Cabernet and, and uh, Carmen Air can share similar terroirs in similar uh, countries. Great. And, and Evan, how is it, given that it's Cabernet, um, how is it not more Bordeaux Medoc? Well, if it is Cabernet, we don't know that it's Cabernet uh, yet. Um, it, it would be, first of all, we don't know if, even if it's from France yet. So I'm going to so use can... the opportunity to use this and then I'll come back to your question. So this wine is Carmenere uh, and it is from Chile and it's specifically from Colchagua. Uh, I think a couple of things um, that would be important to note here. Cabernet um, is generally going to be broader shouldered. Uh, the tannins are going to be more uh, pronounced. The flavor profile is going to not have quite as many um, uh, green elements. I mean, you do get vintages in, in Bordeaux where, where, where it picks up sort of a greener, more herbal thing. But generally, if you get that sort of pasilla, serrano, jalapeno, green pepper sort of character in a ripe wine um, in Bordeaux, it's not going to juxtapose with the nature of the fruit. Um, this to me speaks as much towards sort of the modern day rethink on Carmenere in Chile as it does about that. Uh, a few years ago, frankly, not that long ago, when Carmenere was planted in the wrong places, in spots that were too cool, in yields that were too high, um, the wines were, were, were perhaps more easily identifiable, but for the wrong reasons. Um, I think this particular wine, which comes from Colchagua, from uh, the Maquis winery, uh, and sits in a very interesting uh, confluence of uh, two rivers, the Chimbarango and Tinguarique uh, rivers. They're sort of on a gravel gravelly alluvial soil with clay underbed. Doesn't it actually remind you a little bit if, uh, of sort of the Medoc area and the wines, uh, the quality across the varietals that they make pronounce itself that way. But I think what's interesting here to note is a couple of keys that came off to me. First of all, the color. Um, Cabernet, while it does have dark color, um, the, the, the growing season for Carmenere is longer. And the growing season in a, in, a, in a warmer year like this year, like 17 was, um, develops more of the anthocyanins. So you get more deep pigmentation there, um, even, even more so um, if you look structurally as to how, how much anthocyanin quantity Cabernet has against it. And that to me um, shows well. Also the way that the phenolics just develop in general um, had more of a, a roundness to it. Ca uh, Cabernet always has more, more of an uh, austerity to it in that older world here. What's interesting here is how all of us have a tendency to sort of confuse that sort of uh, intersection of, of Carmenere Merlot, which can also be green, but tends to be softer and plusher than uh, Carmenere does. And, um, and Cabernet Franc, to me, more than, than Cabernet Sauvignon, because it shares that sort of tobacco leafy uh, kind of element that's there. Um, and that's where the color, to me, is usually the giveaway along with that. Um, so this wine, um, again, to me, is sort of like classic modern day really good example of what, uh, of what uh, Colchagua is all about. Um, and if you do grow in warmer climates with moderate yields, you're going you're gonna to pick up on all that. But it has the florals, it has the flesh, it has the combination of red and black fruit, um, and all those other good things. I'm Evan curious if anyone, if anyone, uh, Li Mang in the other, did anyone put uh, Chinon? Because I can see aromatically why someone would go there. And I think you know, Evan talked a lot about green elements, but I really think that that's important here and not just pyrazinic pepper, but that, you know, um, uh, green yeah. olives, the leafiness, mm -hmm. you know, there's, and it's combined with, with, um, with organic earth that to me speaks specifically to Carmenere and also to take it away from uh, Chinon, the color. So that's where the color yeah. sometimes can sweat, set you free. So thank yeah. you for putting me um, the I'm going to give uh, time to one question on this one. We have to move to the last wine. Would you consider this wine to have stem inclusion? I'm getting some of that green twiggy tannin, but only slightly. Is stem inclusion more obvious? 
Um, I, I, th that's hard to say. I, I don't have the, the tech sheet um, in front of me and I would have to look it up. Uh, it would not, it would, it would surprise me only because the variety is, is that way by definition and I wouldn't necessarily want to accentuate it. Having said that, this is a particularly warm year. And for those of you who remember what was going on in Chile in 2017, uh, there were a lot of fires. Um, people had to manage smoke taint. Um, you couldn't necessarily, uh, lead, you know, work for perfect lignification all the time and all that, but I would expect it to be, um, it would be harder. So I would think given this variety, they would probably stay away from it. But again, without the tech sheet in front of me, I don't really know. Um, it doesn't necessarily, also the tannins um, don't have that sort of punch. If there is um, any wood, if you will, stem inclusion in here, it's very lignified. It's very brown, stemmed in brown seeds because it, the wine doesn't have that sort of more angular, hard, tonic angle that that um, poorly managed stem inclusion would give you. I, I do want to add that Ricardo uh, Rivadonera actually is online from Chile right now and he hey, said that there's no stem inclusion on this wine. Our vineyard is surrounded by wild herbs and we have some aromas from the herbs as well from the Carmenere variety. We do have some winemakers usually on our webinars just kind of lurking behind so it's great to see you here Ricardo. Thank you for joining us from Chile. Yeah, and lovely wine, too. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. Another one to memorize, by the way. Note to self out there. This yeah, is and, and just before we jump into the last wine, Madeline, I think for those of you who are trying to put your, um, your little ribbon on a wine, this, if, if, if you have an old, antiquated vision of what Carmen Air is, this is the one. I mean, this is the, the, the new school of Carmen Air, planted in the right places, uh, vinified correctly from good terroirs, mm -hmm. Um, from good vines. So uh, another great. one to put in the uh, chest. Madeline, you have 12 minutes on the oh, last Oh, great. Point. I better speed through. And I was going to say, also on that Carmenere, the complexity of it. You know, it's really a great example. So bravo, the team that made it. So wine number six. Um, if you want to have a little fun and don't drop the glasses, compare it um, visually to wine number five, because uh, the center of this one is equally opaque and it actually has equal amounts of stain, but the color is different. And you gotta get in the habit of being very disciplined about defining color, because wine number five is more of a, of a, a single hue from the center to the rim with blue tones, and wine number six um, is dominantly dark ruby to me. I mean, it has purple also, but there's a, a color gradation from the center to the rim. And again, you're not gonna decide anything from looking at it but hold the thought because it's part of the larger picture. And sometimes we'll, with deduction, when you pivot back to the color, it will set you free. So what leads this wine? To me, the aromatics are just, they make me giggle. They're so generous. But the first wave is all about this fresh, but perfectly ripe, almost overripe, but not cooked red fruit, red currant, red plum, red raspberry, red cherry, you know, there is um, blended fruit in here, not blue, but you know, there are black raspberry, black plum elements to this as well, but the ripeness of it is just what's uh, exquisite and um, attractive. And also really melted in there are um, oak elements that are not commanding your attention, but are definite. You know, the sweet, um, uh, sweet vanilla, chocolate, uh, almost maple syrupy, and I'm getting a whole uh, head on the, the grid, but hold tight. I think we can go ahead, actually, because that's fine. We're going to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, florality has come up a lot in red wines today, and I find that wonderful, because we often, you know, I think relegate fl floral elements to, um, to white wines, and frankly, after sitting through, thanks to Evan, a bunch of Duro reds with the Tarigas, you know, where you get, you know, flowers or... Um, florality from Malbec in Argentina, it really reset me. And this definitely, it's not primary, but right after the first wave of very ripe fruit and oak, you get, um, you know, pretty lavender violet tones. Um, other vegetables, you know, um, nothing green here, but there's a fennel anise character that's also um, mirrored uh, on the nose. It's mirrored on the palate in the form of licorice. Um, also, you know, the garig, both the fresh and probably more dried herbs. Very pretty in here. A little bit of peppercorn. Um, and then, again, I mentioned it already, but there's a strong uh, organic earth element. I really don't find inorganic in this. And if you're struggling between organic and um, inorganic, 
the gardeners will know what we're talking about, you know, turned dirt, that smell or dust. Animal, you know, it really took a while for this wine to um, show that element, but it's in there. It's more, not a strong meaty character, but almost like, and this is a vegetarian talking, but I taste everything, a little more lamb than anything else. But um, it's got a little bit of a sausagey character to it, a little bit of um, bacon fat, a smokiness to it. Um, the oak aging is obvious, but again, not compelling. And it's not immediately evident whether, you know, we're in American oak, French oak combo. I would bet it's a combination of uh, uh, new oak and used oak um, and also different kite kinds of wood. But, you know, there you have the sweetness of the oak and it really brings home how oak can add an illusion of sweetness to the wine. I would bet money there's at least partial whole cluster in this. I can't speak to sem inclusion definitively, but I wouldn't worry about it in this wine. You know, the fruit is being punched up uh, by the ripeness, the natural ripeness, and also the winemaking. I mean, this wine is flat out delicious. Um, structurally, very interesting wine. Uh, the acidity is actually quite mouthwatering. I wouldn't say there's anything medium about this. This is medium plus to me and even sticks out a little bit and hold that thought. The tannin is very smooth. You know, um, on this tasting today, there's nothing high about it. It is medium plus, but finely grained. The texture is plump. Uh, we don't have that down there, but round and smooth can be plump as well, right? <laughs> um, complexity, you know, it's sufficient, but this wine is more about sort of primal, delicious characters, certainly balanced, certainly fruit driven. Um, so, I, I managed to shove that right along, Li Bang. You we did, you did. You have varieties. <laughs> I am going to share the poll. So this is going to be wine number six's poll. And I will say, but I love, of all the polls that we've done, I love the options of these three grape varieties, you know. Mm. And I'm very curious to see um, where you guys go with this. So we have Malbec, Syrah, Zinfandel, or mm -hmm. other. And again, if you're in other and you have questions about those other, throw that into Q&A. And I see that we are uh, between really old world France and new world Australia, as well as new world California. Whichever one of you decided to put Croatia in here, that's getting no votes. <laughs> What, what about grape varieties? How are we doing on grape varieties? Lumen? We have a lot of Syrahs in here. Um, and But we have people picking all the other options too. Malbec and Zinfandel. So I do, I do think you have your work cut out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, here's a good comment from Jerry that this was very lost, uh, a very lost experience for him because it was sending him to Portugal with Toriga Nacional because of the oak influence. So I think maybe um, as we're letting the poll just run its course, uh, mm -hmm. Madeline, if you could just give a little bit of um, what is pointing you specifically to some to, place. Well, yeah, I will say, you know, for whatever it's worth, because florality can certainly, as we've seen today, you know, uh, is, is uh, an element that can put you in many different places. But certainly if we consider Malbec, what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, Argentine Malbec. We're talking about opaque color. Oh, can you put that back up again? Or, oh, yeah. sorry. You can put, uh, you know, because of the opaque color, it definitely has a floral element to me. It has little, if any, green, you know, it depends on the wine and smooth tannins. Um, you know, Syrah, um, the tannin structure can vary depending on where it's grown. I think it's, le and also Malbec to me definitively have some, has a blue fruit element to it. Syrah, you know, can tend towards red or black fruit, not often blue. The tannins can be, you know, structured a little bit drying, but not necessarily hard. Um, and certainly if you get uh, compelling either meaty or smokiness or pepper elements to it, that'll help you consider it in, in, a, in a serious way. Zinfandel, very interesting. Uh, again, more dominantly dark fruit for me. Uh, because of the inconsistency or in the ripeness of the grape variety, you can have a little bit of uh, confusion on the acidity level. Um, and, you know, the wood can be quite compelling on Zinfandel, depending on who's made it. Also, interestingly to me, Zinfandel has a simplicity to it, even at its best, which is a little sort of a kumbaya thing to say. Old world versus new, I think we'll talk about that when we reveal the grape variety. 
Great. I just wanted to defend the Croatians before we uh, <laughs> move on here. Uh, as many no, we're, we're know, hugging but, the Croatians. Yeah, that, but yes. if, you, if you pull that thing together, <laughs> um, Zinfandel in its most primal form is Croatian, right? It's yeah. Krielnak, oh. it's Blavich, it's all those things. So, um, and what's not to say we wouldn't have gone that way. This is all about education. And yeah. before, I reveal, before I reveal it, Kathleen did say that we didn't mention VA. Did anybody get VA on this wine? Volatile acidity. Un poquito. <laughs> Not enough to annoy you, you know, or to distract you. Uh, and, you know, to me, VA is not unlike, and they're probably going to cringe when I say this, Britannomyces. If it doesn't command my attention and mm -hmm. if it's an element, I'm good with it. It just yeah. adds, yeah. you know. Yeah. Another thing in there to consider and to add to the complexity. So what are we looking so at? So Kathleen, Kathleen, you know, the VA of this is from really ripe fruit, even raisinated fruit mm -hmm. in a hot fermentation. So yeah, there's a little bit of it. Good and question. voila, Barossa, Barossa, I learned how to say it. It's not Barossa, it's Barossa Shvaz, right? And I think it really speaks to this and beautifully. The thing that impressed me about this wine knowing what is, and I did look up the text sheet on this because I thought, how did they manage the oak on this? Because they did a really good job. It is a combination of French, American, and Hungarian. It is several different sizes, including puncheons, and one of these guys will have to describe octave to me because I don't know what it is, you know. Um, but I think what I would like to speak to is why Shiraz specifically and why not Old World Shiraz? Old World Shiraz, aka Syrah, will generally have tartar fruit, less, you know, overt ripe fruit character, more meatiness, probably a little bit more meatiness or animal in the form of Britannomyces, lower oak levels, um, you know, higher minerality. This had an organic earth tone and frankly, a lighter color in, in many cases, unless it's uh, Hermitage. Um, and I would say that in terms of a growing region for New World, uh, Syrah, AKA Shiraz, you know, the only other thing I would personally consider would be Washington State or cooler sites in California, but you will have, you know, um, more of an elegance and a little bit more sort of uh, white pepper tones that you get in the Northern Rhone. Uh, but I think this is a beautiful example of um, Avasi Shiraz. And to me, it's dictated by that licorice, anise, back tone of meat, ripe fruit, uh, verging on candied, but not. Um, significant amount of w but very well-managed oak. Gentlemen, you wanna? Actually, can Evan? I Oh. Evan, you wanna go first? No, you go, you go ahead. I have okay. one thing, one question that I wanna make sure is asked uh, of Madeline, since you did look at the text sheet. Did they add Viognier to this? They didn't admit it if they did. <laughs> I think I can answer that. Uh, you know, this is, uh, Yenumba is one of my favorite uh, family-owned wineries mm -hmm. in Australia and Barossa. And I've been there several times. They actually mm -hmm. are one of the few wineries that still make their own cooperage. So they make, the American oak they use, they make practically all of it on site. Uh, I think, and this is just me, my opinion, I think the Australians uh, do tannin management and red wine as well or better than anyone on the planet. And so for me, the, the combination of lots of fruit, pepper, savory, mm. soy sauce, beef jerky notes. But umami, also the, yes. Yeah, umami. the texture of this wine, for a wine with that much color and to have the tannins be so finely grained, I mean, that to me took me right to Australia. And uh, I will just say for tannin, the, the best wine visit tasting I ever did was at Hinchke. So uh, I just think the Australians are... are compulsive about tannin and red wine and they start in the vineyard and carry it all the way through the bottle. So Yolamba's just, famous for Viognier, no. but they're not claiming Viognier uh, tucked in here. And, to my uh, knowledge, there's no Viognier in this yeah. particular bottling. Actually, you know, uh, Maddie, you're right. Yolamba has more Viognier planted mm -hmm. than anyone on the planet and they right. make more of it than anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're inexpensive Viognier, you know, to sell rocks. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you, guys. Um, I have two questions that I would love for Evan to actually answer. Uh, one question is, what does one do with wine that's left over in the bottle? Because oftentimes they do have wines left. Do you expect the wine to change in quality as it's left in the bottle? Yeah, I would say that, that this wine, uh, albeit in a 187 versus a half bottle or a 750, is no different per se than any other wine, which is to say left untreated, it will degrade over time. 
But even though it's not the same thing, even though it's not a, a, a cork or whatever, a quick little hit of, um, of uh, mixed gas, like say from a private preserve can, will hold these wines well for several days. I've experimented with them a lot and had no issues. Um, the wine, you know, left to their own, um, they're enjoyable certainly for the rest of the day and uh, perhaps even in the next day. But if I was going to hold on to them from longer than that, I would treat them when, as I would any other wine with a quick sparge of uh, inert gas. And then the last question here is, does decanting for aeration, swirling, or um, uh, the wine, does the same thing, same results to get your aeration? Would you recommend decanting these particular bottles? Yeah, if, if one has the time, you know, our, 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 our lack of uh, or our use of decantation is that whole uh, 15 minutes before, pour it into the glass and just let it sit there. So we're not, um, with, that's our decanting. We then swirl it additionally, but what I would not do um, through multiple experiments here is crack the bottles, pour them, and then jump right in because the wines are so tight uh, right out of the bottle. They need um, as much help as they can. There are some um, wine glasses out there uh, these days that do a little bit of aeration for you. Um, my experiments with some of those have been positive uh, as well, but anything you can do to get some air into the, into the wine faster uh, coming out of that smaller bottle will definitely help out. So whether it's pouring it out 15 minutes ahead of time, swirling it like crazy. Um, if you wanted to can it into a decanter and then pour it into a glass, that works too. Or um, you know, simply pouring it out more than 15 minutes will also help it. I find these wines hit their sweet spot, as I said earlier, somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Great, excellent. I wanna say thank you to Evan, Madeline and Tim uh, from again, being on our panel. And um, it's great to have you guys on here. And I personally learn a lot from you guys whenever you guys talk about wine. Um, until next time, I have a couple of things to share with you guys. If you're feeling overwhelmed, we always end with this. You are not alone, keep it fun. Over time, you will get more and more. If you've been here from the very first webinar, I'm sure you're feeling more empowered to be tasting already. Um, Please share the love. We, you know, it's been a soft launch for us so far, even though we've really been shipping a lot of kits already. But please do share the love and help us get the word out there on Master the World. Um, we did push back the next webinar to September 23rd. Um, the orders, the wine's been sitting in our warehouse getting ready um, because we do hold our wines for QC and for bottle shop, uh, bottle shop period to make sure that the wines are in a comfortable place before we send them to you. We will not probably sh ship them next week. We're going to give it a a little bit more time. Part of the issue is, and I want to say a special shout out to our production crew who's producing through this webinar. We usually ask production crew to stop during the webinar so they can be a part of it. Um, but given the potential evacuation issues, um, we just wanted to get our production a little bit ahead to, uh, for the rest of this week. So, um, you know, we don't know where the temperature is going to take us. We're certainly going to take a lot of precautions. So the last thing I will say is that we are going to take some liberties. We've updated our summer shipping policy. We are adding ice to every single package we send out. Uh, we're going to give you options for next day air, but if we don't feel that the wine is going to get to you in a day, uh, we're not going to ship it and we're going to hold it for you so that we can protect what you've invested in. Um, we will be reaching out to different people in different places to give you your options. Um, and if you are ordering in, you will soon see that the option is only going to be next day air or hold until um, further notice, uh, probably in sometime in October. Um, but we do sell out every month. So if you wanna have this month's or this upcoming month's wine, you do want to purchase and ask us to hold it for you. Uh, without further ado, we're uh, just a minute over. Thank you so much guys for being a part of this. Um, it's been great. Um, and if we don't have any other questions that are, uh, we have any questions that are not answered, we'll send it out in a follow-up email. Thank you once again, guys. Thank, um, you, everybody. We'll you, Thank you, everybody. It's so Thank much you. fun for us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Agreed. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.